The Raspberry Pi Pico is a fun little microcontroller board, but I wanted to take it a step further and create my own PCB around that RP2040 microcontroller. Keep in mind that this video is not a step-by-step -step process of how to lay out a board. I have several other videos that I recommend checking out if you want to see how to do that, whether it's getting started with KiCad or also see my Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 videos where I actually create a board around the CM4. This is more of a collection of lessons learned that I had to go through in order to create my own board for that RP2040. The idea I had was to create a stackable programmer slash debugger. As you can see, in order to use Pico Probe separately to debug another Raspberry Pi Pico, it takes up a lot of space on these breadboards. So what I want to do is have something that goes underneath or on top of my target Pico to help me debug it and program it so that it takes up less space and I can kind of prototype around it. Don't worry about making exactly this. You can feel free to take this idea and create your own PCB around the RP2040 for your own purposes. The best place to go to figure out what we need to do to lay out a board around the RP2040 is obviously the data sheet. Specifically, we want to go to electrical and mechanical section, and here's where they show you all the information you need about the package. The important thing here is that it's a QFN package, there is no visible lead, so it's going to be a little tricky to solder. We won't be able to do it by hand, so we're going to need to use hot air or some type of reflow oven. And it's a 0.4 millimeter pitch uh, between your pins here. If we zoom down, you can see the recommended footprint. And good news for us, we don't actually have to create this footprint in KiCad. DigiKey, if you go to the RP2040 or the Pico page, the product page, you can find that Ultra Librarian has already added the footprint for the RP2040 and we can download this for KiCad and include it in our library which makes the layout process much easier. Raspberry Pi made this fantastic document called Hardware Design with RP2040 and it walks you through a basic layout and schematic for creating a very simple board around the RP2040. In fact, I recommend reading through this document at the very least, chapter two. They give you all the great recommendations to figure out what you need to do to make the RP2040 work. I'll point out some of the major parts that you need to remember here. First is the power section. They give you a good design here to start with. The Pico actually uses a buck boost converter, which is a little bit of overkill. We generally don't need to boost stuff unless you're working with lower voltages than say your 5 volts or lower than 3.3 volts. Maybe you're coming off of a LiPo battery and you need to consider it. But for my purposes, at least for the debugger, I plan to power everything off of the USB, which is 5 volts. So we can honestly just use a buck converter or a really simple LDO. And it looks like that's what they're recommending here is an LDO and that's what I'm going to go with. If we scroll down, they give you recommendations about how to work with the decoupling capacitors. The big thing is that you need to have 100 nanofarad capacitors by each of the IOVDD pins. You can see them listed out here, but you'll want each capacitor to be close as possible to each of these pins. The other thing is that you will need these one microfarad capacitors near the input and output of the 1.1 voltage regulator that is apparently built into the RP2040. There's one pin that outputs 1.1 volts and there's another pin that needs to have 1.1 volts taken in and you'll want one microfarad capacitors near each of those. What I noticed is that the layout guide talks about using 0402 capacitors so that you can kind of do these inline components However, if you've ever tried to hand solder 0402s, you probably have seen that it can be a little difficult. If you're going to produce something with a pick and place machine for mass manufacturing, yeah, great, go with 0402s or 0201s, but I'm gonna try to do this with 0603s because they're a little easier to hand solder. Should I want to hand solder this? We will see. Um, however, that is going to make it a bit of a tight squeeze because I can't do these nice inline capacitors like this. They're going to take up a lot more room on this board. Something else to keep in mind, the RP2040 does not have onboard flash, so you need to bring your own flash. This is what, BYOF. And it recommends using a quad spy protocol to communicate with your off-chip 
flash component. What I have found is that the quad spy communication for many of these flash chips is fairly standardized. You'll want to look at the data sheet for each of your flash chips to make sure that it supports the commands that are outlined in 2.6. So if I go there in my document here, you can see where it talks about, hey, look at the data sheet for your quad spy flash chip. Make sure it supports these commands with these given command values. If you can find something that supports quad spy using those commands, ideally you can find something that's kind of a drop-in replacement for this Winbond electronics part here. I'm going to try it and we'll see if it works. I'm not going to hold my breath. Something that I found interesting is how they do the boot select. And on the Pico, this is a button, but they're showing it as a jumper here for this basic PCB. The idea is that you should bring this USB boot line to ground, whether it's through a jumper or a button, and that actually forces this chip select line low. The RP2040 watches this line. If the line is low when it first boots, it causes the RP2040 to go to its USB boot mode where it enumerates as a mass storage device on your system. If the line is high, it then tries to boot from this flash chip. And that's how it does the switching between the boots whenever you hold the button on the Pico and give it power. It recommends adding a pull-up resistor here in order to keep the chip select line high on boot, um, unless you're pushing the button, of course. They mentioned that specifically for this W25Q128 chip that they didn't need a 10K pull-up and they just don't place this resistor, but I'm going to go ahead and place it because the data sheet recommends it. I'm not going with their empirical evidence here. I'm going to follow the data sheet for whichever flash chip that I'm using. Let's take a look at the oscillator. They recommend going with a 12 megahertz oscillator and adding some capacitors to achieve the proper load capacitance. They give you the formula here. You should look at the data sheet to figure out what your load capacitance should be, and then follow this formula to calculate which capacitors or which values of capacitors you need to add here. Many of these crystals also recommend adding an inline 1K resistor to X out. Once again, look at your data sheet. I've also seen some that add some sort of parallel resistor here. I'm gonna go ahead and add a footprint here just in case, but I'm gonna just choose not to populate it. The last thing we wanna look at is the USB. For the RP2040, they recommend adding these 27 ohm, or I guess 27.4 ohm, but I'm gonna use 27 ohms and call it good enough. These are termination resistors on your D plus D minus lines for USB to make the communication work. I believe they would be the same if you're using a USB-C connector, but I'm going to follow this diagram and use a USB-B connector anyway. Feel free to use USB-C for your own design, but make sure you look at the schematics and recommended layout for that. This document does offer a full schematic, and this is actually a really good starting place for laying out your board around the RP2040. I definitely recommend reading through this whole document, at least chapter two, to get an idea of what you need to make the RP2040 work. At the time of filming this, we're in the middle of a global chip shortage, so finding some of these recommended parts is proving to be a little difficult. The Pico guide that I was showing you earlier recommends using one of these Winbond Electronics flash memory chips. These were not in stock when I originally ordered some parts. They are now, so if you can get them, great. Otherwise, I have found this potentially cheaper drop-in replacement that hopefully works, we will see, uh, from Macronix, and I hope I'm pronouncing that one correctly. This had a few thousand in stock when I originally ordered, so I guess order whichever one is in stock for your particular board, and like I said, we will see if this drop-in replacement works. The other chip that I find is really useful is this AP2112K. It's a 3.3 volt low dropout linear regulator. They're pretty cheap. They can supply up to 600 milliamps, which is fine for most USB and basic applications. I noticed that companies like SparkFun and Adafruit really enjoy using this on a lot of their PCBs. If you look at their schematics, they love this AP2112K. However, it's really tough to find. Um, I guess a lot of those companies are buying them out and I found this other drop-in replacement. Once again, I hope it's a drop-in replacement. It's a little pricier, as you can see here. However, it gives me a little more current, um, but either way, it should be the same package. Uh, the, when I checked the data sheets, the pinouts were the same. 
We'll see. We'll see if it works as a drop-in replacement. The other thing I recommend doing is looking for these EDA CAD models. Ultra Librarian or Snap EDA should have something, and it, hopefully it's listed on DigiKey. If not, search for them in Ultra Librarian or Snap EDA. It makes life much easier rather than trying to create the footprint yourself. Um, even if you're not going to verify it, you can at least hope that they work from one of these sites. Generally, I find that they do work. I haven't had many problems pulling KiCad library parts from these sites. Once you've downloaded the library parts from Ultra Librarian or Snap EDA, what you'll want to do in KiCad is go to Preferences, Manage Symbol Libraries, go to your project-specific libraries, click to add a new folder, and go to wherever you download them. So I keep them in libraries, I just download them here. Anything with the date is from Ultra Librarian, anything with the part number is from Snap EDA, and I just found them from the site that had them. Whatever had them, I would use that one. And we want to go in and add the .lib, so you would just add that. I've already added it here. It'll show up here, and all of your schematic library parts will be listed for your project. And you can just click OK. That should include it in your project. You'll want to do the same thing for Manage Footprint Libraries, and this is for your layout. Go to Project Specific Libraries, add a folder, of course, this browser window looks a little different, and you'll want to go into your libraries wherever you downloaded them. You'll want to go into the folder with your downloaded library, and you'll want to click one of the folders that says dot pretty. That's a folder that contains your footprint. So you say okay to that. What I have found is that for the parts from Ultra Librarian, when you include them, it will keep the nickname of footprints because that was the name of the folder, and they're all gonna do that and have that as the nickname, and then when you try to save it, it will yell at you, so you'll want to rename the nickname as something else based on your part. So I'm gonna call it RP2040, and that's the name that's gonna show up when we go to associate footprints with schematic symbols. From there, let's go ahead and open up our schematic. I'm gonna walk you through some of my design decisions here for the schematic. First up is the USB. I'm going to use a USB-B micro just so it matches what's on the Pico, but feel free to substitute a USB-C for your own. I have another video laying out a board for the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 where I use USB-C, so feel free to take a look at that. Note that to use it, you're going to need a couple of extra resistors to make it work, but this keeps it simple. I can use the same cable for this board as well as the Pico since I plan to stack the Pico on top of this board. And I kind of follow the Pico's design here where there's VBUS and then there's a diode that prevents any sort of current coming back from VSYS into my USB line in case I have, I guess, more voltage on the VSYS pin. And I'm using this AP2112 or whatever my drop-in replacement is going to be, a couple of decoupling capacitors as well as my enable line is pulled up. This one's fairly simple. You can find reference schematics for this in the data sheet for the AP2112, as well as on SparkFun and Adafruit. This is a very popular voltage regulator. I also attached a green LED to GPIO25 on the RP2040 through a 1K resistor. This is very similar to what you'll find on the Pico, although I think they use a resistor with less resistance to make the LED a little brighter, but it's attached to the same pin, and the reason for that is when I load Pico Probe, that firmware, onto this RP2040, it causes GPIO25 to blink or light up and give us some status codes, and I want that to work exactly the same. So I'm just going to keep this LED on here. I'm not putting a simple power on LED, but you are welcome to add one of those if you'd like, or attach LEDs to other pins. As you'll notice, many of these pins are not connected, so that's really up to you how you want to connect the RP2040. I think the RP2040 comes with bootloader out of the package, which means I should be able to just upload programs to it over USB, but I'm not entirely sure about that yet. In fact, I haven't looked at the documentation for programming this thing when it's new as a brand new chip, not part of a Pico or any other board. So that'll be a fun one. We'll figure out how to upload a program to it. If USB programming does not work, I've gone ahead and added the SWD port so that I can send and debug programs directly to my device here. Instead of using a button for reset, which you can do, I added a simple jumper, which is gonna be a two-pin header. 
I can connect a wire to it, I can solder on headers so that I can manually throw this chip into reset if I want to. I also followed the layout guide that I showed you earlier. For the RP2040, there is a pull-up resistor on run. This basically tells the RP2040 that it should just run. What I noticed when looking at the Pico schematic is there is no pull-up, which makes me believe that run is internally pulled up and you can pull it to ground if you want to, say, reset the chip, which is why I have it over here as a potential way to pull it down to ground. Like I said, you can do it with a button if you want, but I'm gonna leave it as a jumper. Um, but I am gonna add this pull up. I figure I can always just choose not to populate that footprint if I want to. I added the termination resistors onto D plus and D minus for the USB lines. The note says that these should be closer to the pins on the RP2040 and farther away from the USB port. Um, I guess because they are termination resistors. I added a whole bunch of decoupling capacitors and rather than try to put it on each pin, I just kind of group them down here with a little note to myself when I'm doing the layout. Hey, each of these, you know, C1 through C7, one of those should be close to each IOVDD pins, which you can see are connected to 3.3 volts throughout the chip. This 0.1 microfarad capacitor needs to be close to the ADC AVDD pin. I also have another couple of capacitors that need to be close to the 1.1 volt DVDD pins. This diagram I think shows it a little better than what was in that hardware guide. There's a voltage regulator internal to the RP2040 that outputs 1.1 volts. Uh, it's getting that from the 3.3 volts, it's dropping that down to 1.1 volts, and that's going back in and powering a whole bunch of digital electronics that are in the RP2040. The core, for example, uses 1.1 volts uh, to keep everything low power. The output of the 1.1 volt regulator is coming out here. That's feeding into these DVDD lines. The input to that regulator is this VREG in, and that should be tied to the 3.3 volt line and that's also decoupled with a one microfarad capacitor. As I showed earlier, I've got a 12 megahertz crystal, just like we saw in the hardware guide. I am putting a parallel resistor here. Sometimes you'll see the crystals require some type of parallel resistor. It's like one mega ohm or something like that, but I'm just gonna put the footprint here and just say, hey, do not place. Um, if I end up using a crystal that requires it, I have the option to add that resistor should I choose. As I showed earlier in that hardware document, the RP2040, checks the chip select line to go low in order to go into USB boot mode. If it's pulled high, it then goes into boot mode where it boots from this flash memory. This should look exactly like it was in that hardware guide where we've got the little decoupling capacitor over here and then our special USB boot toggle mode that goes to our button that's here. All it does if you push this button is connect the USB boot line to ground, and that's what causes this CS line to go low. Finally, I've got the headers. As you can see, it should be the same headers as the Pico, the same basic footprint, because what I'm going to do is pass through the Pico lines to the breadboard using one of those Arduino long stackable headers. That's my idea. We'll see if it works. I've tied a couple of pins to my host or my debugger RP2040 because that's what's needed to debug it, including the TX and RX lines. These are connected to some PIO pins that have been configured on the debugger to communicate with the target RP2040. I'm gonna add some solder bridge jumpers here. You can just cut these if you want to disconnect these lines and not have your UART out any longer. The other thing is I've connected the ground pins to be shared between this debugger and the target Pico, as well as VSYS. I am choosing to have VSYS, which is the node just past this diode going into the voltage regulator, and that will also be passed to the target Pico in order to power it. So you won't need to power the target Pico separately unless you cut this solder jumper here and that will allow you to provide your own power to the target Pico if you want to do that for whatever reason. And the last thing on these headers are these target SWD pins. The clock and data lines are being controlled by GPIO pins two and three, which I believe are programmed using PIO inside Pico probe. So those control clock and data, those need to be attached to the target Pico. 
And I'm gonna give you two options. One, you can just solder some headers on the underside of the target Pico so that it connects directly to this debugger. That messes up your ability to put the Pico into a breadboard without using the debugger. Or you can run some jumper wires from this debugger to the Pico target board. And I'll show you that when we get to the layout. Because it's KiCad, it means we will likely have to associate footprints with the schematic parts manually. If you set everything up right with your schematic parts, you can assign preferred footprints, but that did not happen here. So we will have to open this little assignment window and go through these manually. I've already assigned these. What I did was for all of my capacitors, resistors, the little two pin supporting electronics, I did 0603 and I made sure to use the hand solder footprints. For example, let's go to capacitors, SMD. You can kind of see where we've got the non-polarized 0603 and I've got the hand solder versus non-hand solder one and that's just really the size of the pads. So we can view the footprints. There's the non-hand solder one that's meant to be done with a pick in place and here is the hand solder version where these pads are a little bit longer so you can get a soldering iron in here. I always prefer to do this with my boards in case I need to hack something or a lot of times I solder them by hand anyway. If you're gonna go strictly pick and place or you know you're gonna use a reflow oven, you don't have to do this for your own design, but I like to do it anyway. For the downloaded components, you're gonna have to manually assign these most of the time. So for example, Let's go to this AP2112. It should be in the AP2112 if it's from Ultra Librarian. It should be the library nickname that you assigned when I show you how to add that library in. And then we'll just select that. And feel free to view these and you can see it's that five pin component here. You'll want to click Save Schematic and Continue for your own project so that it updates the schematic and updates the component list when we go to the PCB, which I'm gonna bring up now. Let's start by turning off the copper layers so you can see what's going on with the footprint placement. I'm also going to turn off my bottom silk and user drawings, and there's one more I wanna turn off my FAB. There we go, that should give you an idea of how I laid out some of these components. The basic idea of this whole board is to be the same shape and size as the Pico. However, I ran into an issue because I want to use DK Red's new service to produce this PCB and they have minimum design constraints where each dimension needs to be at least one inch long. And the Pico is actually 0.8 inches wide and about two inches long. So if we turn on the user drawings, I had to expand the board out, create these little wings on the sides here to make it an inch wide and it's long enough to be fabbed, but you'll notice that what I did was add this little tail piece onto it um, because when the Pico stacks on top of it, if you don't populate this header down here to where the Pico snaps into place, then you'll want to populate this header and use jumper wires to get to the Pico's SWD port. For the wings on the side, I decided to make them at least kind of useful rather than just making the board big enough for fab, I added pin numbers in silk screen so that you can tell what those pins are on the target Pico because at the moment they're only printed on the underside which kind of stinks when you're working with the Pico on a breadboard. I also left off pins zero and one as a reminder that you really shouldn't be using them on the target Pico because they should be connected to the debugger unless of course you slice the solder jumpers on the underside. The other thing I did was add mounting holes in what I believe and measured to be the exact same place as on the Pico. So if you wanna put standoffs or whatever on them, you are totally welcome to do that. My plan to solder this up is to put everything through my little homemade reflow oven. That being said, you can also use a hot air gun for just the RP2040 because that's the only QFN part on this whole board where you can't get a soldering iron to any of the pins. While the layout guide recommends using 0402s or even 0201s, which I believe I've seen on the Pico, you'll notice that 
layout's a little tighter around the edges here. I went to 0603s so that I could have the option to hand solder these components should I want to. I also chose other parts with leads, including the button, the crystal, and the memory chip, so I could get a soldering iron in there. I have found that this USB connector is a little tough. I might have to use either a hot air gun or the reflow oven to make this work, um, but I have gotten a soldering iron under here to hit these pads. It's just very difficult. What I noticed is that going to a part with leads for the flash memory chip takes up a lot of space. It's a much smaller chip, like a QFN or something on the Pico, which reduces the size of it and gives you a lot more space to work with. The button is about the same, but the voltage regulator is smaller. However, it does require an inductor on the Pico because it's a buck boost regulator, so I consider that a wash. And the crystal is a lot smaller. It's one of those small, tiny four pin packages where you can't really get a soldering iron under it to solder the pins down. So I went with one of these larger ones that has the pin sticking out of the side. It's about a quarter inch long. As you can see, it still takes up a lot of space on this board. If you do decide to go with 0603 and some of these larger hand soldering parts, you can see that this board is a little crowded for what I'm really comfortable with. My recommendation is to move to something like a four layer board or you'll have to make the board a little bigger if you wanna add more parts than this. Let's take a look at my design rules. I used the more conservative numbers from Osh Park because DK Red is capable of going smaller than these minimum track widths and track clearances, but I'm gonna keep these as the conservative ones just in case anybody else wants to produce this board wherever they choose you should be able to have it produced at almost any fab house because these minimum design rules are so much larger than what a lot of fab houses report to being able to do anyway. That being said, I set the net classes. Uh, you can see that I have my default lines being fairly wide with good clearance. My power lines, I made a little bigger. I actually think on a top layer, 0.18 millimeters is capable of transporting half an amp, maybe more, uh, when I ran through this calculator but I just like to make these as large as possible for carrying power, just in case, you never know. KiCad has a built-in trace calculator, which if you'd like, go check out my previous video where I do a layout for the Compute Module 4, and I walk you through the process of using this PCB calculator. We're doing a differential pair, and we need to make sure that the differential impedance is 90 ohms, if I remember correctly, for USB. So we use 0.77 width with all these parameters that are set in place with the dielectric height being 1.6 millimeters because that's what DK Red is gonna produce for us. We've got a separation as small as we can go at about 0.15 millimeters. And playing around with the numbers, we get 0.77 millimeters for the trace width. That gives us an odd impedance of about 45 ohms. And then we multiply that two to get 90 ohms. This should hopefully work once again it's a very short run of traces going between my USB connector carrying data to the termination resistors that go into the RP2040. Because it's so short, it's one of those, I will do my best to maintain the differential impedance as well as length matching the traces. I really should have some guard ground pour around it, ideally stitched to the ground plane under it, that's even better, but I at least have ground plane under the whole length of wires and it's not split by any traces so that the return current doesn't have to like travel all the way around any of these traces. I tried to keep that one shot where possible. My preference is to route these first, which is why I have the RP2040 lined up like this. So it's a straight shot from the USB data lines to the connector. And I wanted nothing to get in the way of those. Then I like to do the power lines. So if we follow these, you can see how these come through here, V-Sys to my voltage regulator, and then the wider 3.3 volt traces go throughout the board to provide power to any of the components that need it. What I noticed in the RP2040 datasheet, they have nine vias that are stitched to ground. And that is for both grounding the device so that current has a place to go with a lot of routes to the ground plane, as well as heat dissipation. I did my best. I needed some of that space to route these quad spy lines. I couldn't really fan out the traces above the chip here. I just 
quite didn't have room if I wanted to run my power lines to the decoupling capacitors. Once again, if I had 0402s here or something smaller, I would probably have tons of room to get my vias for the quad spy lines out here, but I simply don't. So because of all that, I have about six vias to ground and I'm just gonna hope it's good enough for what I need to do. I'm not super happy with my lines to the crystal. I'm gonna highlight them for you so you can see here's my crystal out. Here's my crystal in. They're supposed to be length matched and they're supposed to be as short as possible going to the crystal and I did that where I could but you can kind of see they swoop out to the left here and then they kind of come back to the crystal that's in the middle of the board. I'm not thrilled with that, but I'm hoping it's good enough. I should really have one point of connection going back from ground outside of the crystal to the ground plane. I didn't do that, um, but it should work. I'm, I'm just going to hope that it's Maybe not the cleanest, but it should allow me to do some prototype debugging with this board and the RP2040 should just run. We will see. In addition to all those components, I threw in some fiducials. Uh, I did my best to get them in opposite corners. My preference would be to have this one like up here. I guess I could put it up here, but I feel like that just kind of destroys the aesthetic of what I'm going for. And I didn't have room up with all these components and the mounting holes. The fiducials were added mostly out of habit because I'm used to making boards um, where production was a possibility. But if you're not going to use a pick and place machine, then you probably don't need to add the fiducials. They're here out of habit and out of the weird notion that maybe one day I will put this board through a pick and place machine and produce more than five of them. On to the bottom layer. I did my best to keep the quad spy lines close together and length match where possible, although I didn't really measure them, I just tried to keep them short and about the same length. I'm not taking a lot of care to make sure that they're length matched once again, hoping that it's just good enough. As you can see, I fan out from the RP2040 going underneath the chip. They go on the bottom layer to the flash chip on this side. The other thing that I added on the underside are these solder jumpers. I feel like the underside is the best place to put them because they don't take up a whole lot of room. I also made some notes about what the jumpers do and I did them as normally closed, which means if you want to open them to disconnect the pins to the host RP2040, you're gonna need to get in here with some type of hobby knife and cut these. And you can always re-solder them if you want. Finally, I put the version number in copper because that's what my habit is. You can put it in silk screen if you want. I put it up here just so I can remember the version number. If I ever produce more than one version, I will try to update this so that if I pick up a board, I know which version I'm looking at. In addition to the solder jumpers, I also added the board name in silk screen over here. Let me turn all of these layers back on. And from here to go into production, we just plot the Gerbers. If you are not gonna produce a stencil, then you can turn off your paste layers for the Gerbers, but I plan to produce a stencil because I find doing stencil with solder paste into a reflow oven is the easiest way to do something like this. So I'm gonna keep these on and have a stencil produced. From here, here are the settings. I put everything into a Gerbers folder and I just plot these, which I've already done, so I won't redo these. And then we can go into generate drill files. Here are the settings to make sure the drill files are okay. What I notice is that DK Red wants to have plated through hole and non-plated through hole in a single file, so you can leave that checked. I'm not just to see if they plate my non-plated through holes. I, I want the mounting holes to be non-plated through holes, so I'm gonna leave it as a separate file just to see if they plate those or not. I, I wanna see if that works. You just click generate drill file, and the last thing, once all of the drill files and Gerbers are produced, I always like to make sure that they were generated correctly. To check that, KiCad has a built-in Gerber viewer, which will open here. Once it's opened, I like to load the drill files first, so we'll load in both of those. These look like they're okay. Then I go to the edge cuts, make sure my board outline looks okay. Yep, everything looks like it lines up. And then I actually add all of the front stuff first and feel free to 
toggle some of these things to make sure everything lines up. Yep, so there's my copper, there is my solder mask, and paste should be about in the same location, yep. And then my silk, yep, all that looks good. Then I'll do the bottom layers and kind of do the same thing here. Copper, yep, everything lines up. The silk screen is there, that looks good. The paste I don't quite see, because there is no paste. And solder mask, yep, everything looks good. So the Gerbers look good, which means we are ready to zip those up and send them off for manufacturing. I've got all of the output Gerber files in the Gerbers folder that's inside of my project directory. And all you wanna do is just highlight them and send them to a compressed zip folder, assuming you're on Windows. Zip them up using whatever tool you have in whatever operating system you're using and I'll rename it to be the name of my project underscore Gerbers underscore and version number. Um, I find that really helpful because I will keep records of the Gerbers with different versions if I ever need to go back and look at them. And now we're ready to go to the Fab House. DK Red is a new PCB prototyping service from DigiKey. It's very similar to the likes of Osh Park or Seed Fusion. If you've ever used one of those, the idea is you can get very inexpensive boards at low quantities, but a lot of your options are limited. These kinds of services I love, especially for my own boards where I just need one or two of them to do some prototyping. To start, just click order your DK Red PCB now. Click on upload your Gerbers. They're looking for a zip file. So we just click on the zip file that we made with all the Gerbers in it. They'll give us a viewer here that we can look through the board and view the different layers. We can toggle some of the layers on and off just like we did on the Gerber viewer. Um, you'll want to leave whatever layers you want on so that you can see it in the next step. When you're done examining to make sure everything looks okay, click finish upload. You'll see your board here and you'll notice that you have some limited options available to you. For example, you can't order less than four pieces. You're limited to the dielectric material being used. The thickness is always 1.6 millimeters. You have to use white silk screen, red solder mask. You have to use Enig for your surface finish and one ounce copper. You can't really choose these if you're using DK Red. However, as you can see, the price for four boards is very reasonable. So all we need to do now is click add to cart, check to make sure you agree with the ITAR requirements. Feel free to look through that and you'll be brought to your regular DigiKey shopping cart where you can check out and order your boards. I have already done that part. So now we just play the waiting game for the boards to come in. I've uploaded all of these design files to a GitHub repo, which you can find at this address, and I'll make sure it's linked in the description. Here, I've provided a very simple description of what the project is, and if you go into hardware, you can find all of the libraries that I downloaded from Snap EDA and Ultra Librarian, as well as the project that is inside of this folder here. A few weeks later, I got the boards in, so let's solder them up and see if they work. To start, what I like to do is create a jig in order to apply solder paste. And to do that, I put three boards, hopefully of the same type, but anything that's the same height will work, around the board that I plan to mount all the components to. I then tape those jig boards around just using some sort of like packing tape or some type of other thin tape. And then I put the stencil on top of it and align up all the holes with the pads. From there, I put another thing of tape on one of the sides of the stencil so that I can create a little door to get into the board and the board can just move in and out. So now we need to apply some paste. I've got my solder paste in a syringe and I'm using some chip quick. This is the TS391SNL50. It's lead free, whether you want to use lead free or not, up to you. And I just put some of this in the syringe. And the fun part is this is what they call thermally stable, which means I don't need to refrigerate this. It can just stay in, you know, a, a air conditioned room at, you know, 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit and it won't go bad for at least a while. So I've got some in my syringe here and I'm just going to put a bead down the side of my board. I've got my 
solder paste spreader, which is really just a credit card. And I'm just going to move the credit card or the spreader across the top of all of the pads. The fun part is, as long as your spreader is mostly clean, you can actually take it, scrape off the solder paste in your little container, and that'll save you some for next time rather than having to waste it. Don't eat this stuff, it's bad for you. Now I'm gonna carefully lift up my stencil and all of the pads should have solder paste on them. I'm going to start with the RP2040 since it's the most complicated chip and in the middle. The RP2040 came with this humidity indicator. Um, I'm not sure the level, the humidity level, because it wasn't labeled um, since this is more or less a prototype batch of RP2040s, but it should be labeled and depending on the level, these might turn pink. They should be blue. If they're pink, that means humidity got to the part and you will probably need to bake the part because when moisture is inside the part and you go to put it through a soldering cycle, that level of heat could cause some of the moisture to boil out and break parts inside the component. So you generally wanna bake all of that moisture out at a low temp for a while so you can use the part. That being said, I a lot of times don't follow this for prototyping because it just kind of works. I would definitely adhere to this for production though. I'm gonna start with the RP2040. To place this part, I'm gonna line up pin one. There's a pin one marker on the board and there's a pin one marker on the chip. All right, as long as you're not off by too much, hopefully when the solder paste reflows, it will cause the chip to snap. And then we just continue along and place the rest of the components around the board. I like to work from the inside towards the RP2040 and going out. Now that I'm done with the passive components, I'm gonna come back and put in the ICs button and crystal. I still need to put in the diode and LED. And just like on the RP2040, my quad spy flash chip has a little pin one marker that's a divot in the component body. And that should line up with the pin one marker on the silk screen. If you're not sure about the polarity of a part, always good to check the data sheet. So I've got my computer open next to me. And that is what I'm doing. The last part is the USB connector. Now that we're done, I'm gonna very carefully pull the board out and take it to my reflow oven. What I have here is a modified toaster oven. I used a Controlio 3 kit from Wizu to hack this thing up over the course of a weekend. It adds an extra heating element and has a whole timing thing with an interface over here. All I'm gonna do is carefully place my board sort of in the center make sure that my thermal probe is floating out in the open there because that's how it's measuring the temperature inside of the oven. I'm going to close it up and then I'm going to choose my profile custom lead free. I made a couple of tweaks to the baseline profile and then I'm just going to say run profile and now we wait. It'll take a few minutes but when it's done the door will open to let it cool off and I can pull my board out once everything's cooled. Even though the Controlio 3 tells me that the board is done and that it is cooled, in reality, it's still gonna be fairly hot. So I recommend using some tool to remove the board very carefully. So what I like to do after pulling the board out is to inspect it to check on the solder joints. It looks okay. The board is actually a little discolored, which makes me think my particular oven's running a little hot. That will be a project for another time to fix the profile for that. The solder joints look a little goldish, which makes me think it's running hot. But most of the joints look okay. I don't see any bridging. I don't see any solder that's missing. And now for the QFN. That side looks okay. Yeah, I see some bridging on the left pads there. That's not great. It's either flux or bridging on the right there. That middle pin looks like it's maybe missing a connection. No, I see it. It's barely in there. It's not great. And 
maybe flux under those left pins, but it could be bridging. I also like to check this under a loop or a microscope. That gives me a much better feel for what's going on than trying to see this through my camera. I checked through my loop here, my little 10x loop, and you can do the same with like a microscope. And I do see some solder bridges. I can see through this better than I can through the macro lens on my camera. And there are a couple of things. If you suspect there's an alignment issue, you can use a hot air gun and try to reflow all of the joints at once. And you can also use a fine tip soldering iron to try to correct bridging that you see that's pretty obvious. So I'm going to attempt to use the hot air gun to rework this. And to do that, I'm going to apply a bunch of flux all around the part. Basically just soak the part in flux. The more flux, the better. Then I'm gonna take my hot air gun. I've got it on about 290, 290 degrees Celsius. I'm gonna start about an inch or two away from the part. And I'm just gonna soak the board. And this will take a minute or two. You'll see the flux start to burn off a little bit. And then I wanna keep doing this for about a minute. This is pre-soaking the board. You don't wanna shock your component with heat in that little area. You'll create a pretty big gradient between your board and that component. And that could damage some things. You could see warpage. Ideally, I should have a hot plate under this. That would really help, but I do not. So I'm just gonna keep soaking the board. All right, it's been about a minute. So I'm gonna take about 30 seconds here, slowly move the nozzle down towards my part and just kind of do little circles with your nozzle. I've got my air at about 75%. That shouldn't blow off anything, but it still provides a good amount of heat output. And you wanna take about 30 seconds to get down to your part, maybe about a quarter to half an inch away. And things should start to reflow. And you'll know they reflow because I can tap the part and it'll move. Just keep doing little circles. And then every now and then I tap it with my tweezers. There it goes, see how I can tap it? And then I just kind of tap it down, make it move back into place. Oops, that was a little too much. Just tap it down into place, move it if you need to. When you're done, do little circles. Take about 30 seconds to come up. Once again, you don't want to shock the part and let it cool too quickly. Once you get about an inch or two away and it's been 30 seconds, you can go ahead and remove the hot air and let the board just kind of cool on its own. Because we used a bunch of flux, you will want to clean off that flux. I probably should have let it cool a little bit more, but that's all right. It's a little too much of a thermal shock there. And dry off your part. Usually takes a couple of times washing it through there with some rubbing alcohol. And there we go. That's how you rework your QFN with hot air. I can't promise that will remove any solder bridges, but you can at least reseat it doing that. You can also take the part completely off and re-solder it using that technique. To fix these bridged pads, you want to use a lot of flux. Just soak the area in flux because that conducts a lot of heat. So you can see I basically just coated that side in flux. I'm going to take my soldering iron and I'm gonna use the smallest tip that I have, which is this little conical tip. If you've got a chisel tip, that works as well. The big thing here is to get your tip very, very clean. I'm gonna tin my tip by applying some solder to it, and then I'm gonna wipe this off as best as I can to get my tip nice and shiny. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag it along the row that I think there are problems focusing especially on the pins that are the issues. When you're done with that, you'll want to recheck to make sure that those pins are no longer shorted. Continue doing that for any pins you believe to be shorted together. And now let's put it into bootloader mode and see if it works. It looks like the Pico does indeed enumerate as a mass storage device, which is excellent. That means it is working. So to try something, it should behave very much like a Pico. So I'm going to go into where I created my Blink program, go into build, grab my .uf2 file. I'm gonna copy that and paste it into the mass storage device drive. And looking at my board, it is not blinking, which means something is wrong.
After chatting with a few people on the Raspberry Pi forums, who were very helpful by the way, I learned that the issue might be the quad spy chip I chose for Flash. The Raspberry Pi documentation recommends this particular chip to work with the Pico or something like it, but it gives you some information on how to work with other chips. Instead of this Winbond W25Q series chip, I ended up going with this Macronix chip, thinking it would be a drop-in replacement, and mostly because the Winbond was not in stock at the time. However, what I found is that that may not be the case, and I would need to create a different board definition file and recompile everything from the SDK for my particular board. That sounds like an effort for a future video, so instead, I went ahead and ordered some W25Qs. They were in stock at the time, and I'm going to rework the board to drop in the Winbond memory chip, and hopefully it will just work then. Let's see. The easiest way I have found to replace the memory part is to just desolder it completely using a hot air rework station, and then solder the new one by hand in the same spot. So let's do that by fluxing everything, applying some hot air, removing the component using some tweezers, and then soldering the new one down using a soldering iron. You could probably put the new chip down using the hot air station, but I'm a lot more confident with my soldering iron skills than I am hot air station skills. And now let's put it in bootloader mode and try it again. Once again, I'm gonna go into the Blink directory, grab my .uf2 compiled Blink program, and drop that in the rpi-rp2 directory. Once it's done, it should restart and hopefully things will work. As you can see, the LED is blinking, which means everything is working. Let's go ahead and solder everything together and upload the Pico Probe firmware. I want to use stacking headers on the board, but as you can see, there's a little bit too much length on each of them, so I need to sand the headers down so that they fit nicely on the board. I'm going to start with some 120 grit and then work my way to like 400 and maybe less if needed. Now that the headers fit, I need to solder them up, so I'm going to take another male header here and I'm just going to use it to hold the two sets of headers together. And then this way, I can put it right on a breadboard. It doesn't really matter where it goes. And that'll hold it in place and hold all the pins so that they are perpendicular to the board while I solder it up. The last thing I want to do is add my little three pin SWD programmer or debugger to the tail of the shoe. And now the whole point of this was so that I could stack a Raspberry Pi Pico on top of it and use a few basic jumper wires to connect debugging to the SWD port on the target Pico. And finally, we can go back into our Blink program, click on main.c. It should be the Blink program that we wrote in a previous episode that just does basic output to the serial terminal and blinks the LED on for a second and off for a second. With everything set up in VS Code, we should be able to go to run and debug, click the play button, that will compile the program, upload it to the target Pico, and then hopefully drop us into a debugging console. This gives us full step through debugging. As you can see, I can click through each of these and it runs one line at a time. If we look at the target Pico, I should be able to control when each of these blinks occur. I hope this video has given you some ideas on how you can create your own PCB around the RP2040. Good luck and as always, happy hacking!